I get the privilege of introducing Roy because we go way back. <laughs> um, Roy and I were students together at the University of Northern Iowa in the uh, 1960s, back in those infamous days. Um, and even among the rebellious, infamous people of, of that time, Roy stood out. Uh, <laughs> He was constantly running, my image of him was running through the hallways, passing out very rebellious sorts of tracks that everyone should read. And uh, he says I might have brain leakage, and he doesn't remember doing that, but uh, I have vivid memories. Anyway, I'm going to hold on to my memories, because I have enough other leakage, Roy, as we go along. Um, well, a little more formal introduction. You have a list of, of some of his accomplishments in terms of uh, writing. He has two books, uh, False Colors, Art Design, and Modern Camouflage, and they, have, they will have copies of this out here uh, uh, when we have the book signing and sell later. Uh, his new book, uh, The Man Who Made Distorted Rooms, um, The Ingenuity of, of Adelbert Ames the II, the, uh, is coming out uh, shortly, and I'm looking forward to getting a copy of that. And uh, it's listed other accomplishments in the... Uh, in your program. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree at UNI where we were students together and got his master's degree from the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, he, uh, current, he's been for the last 15 years at the University of Northern Iowa as a faculty member where he teaches graphic design and graphic design history. So rather than read a, a list of all the things he's published and, and all of his accomplishments uh, in uh, in other fields, uh, I would just like to introduce to you a very well-read clown. That's the way his wife said to introduce him. <laughs> also, also known as Sparky Pullman. <laughs> I'm going to do that thing that they do on Saturday Night Live, you know, where they walk out into the audience and they sing songs and stuff like that. I think that's the way to go. Um, I was uh, talking to uh, Arthur Miller the other day at breakfast, and uh, of course I've known about his work for many years, and um, was very pleased to meet him. But one of the things that he asked me, as sometimes people do, is, is how did you, uh, how did your interest in camouflage begin? Um, some people think that it's because I was in the military at one time, it wasn't, I was drafted, um, and the military wasn't, wasn't interested in camouflage at the time. Um, and some people think it's uh, for other reasons, but it's actually not an interest in camouflage. It, it, it came out of uh, an interest at, because I was a painter and because I uh, wanted to, I wondered if there might be some kind of uh, reliable uh, behavioral perceptual principles uh, of human behavior that, that, that I could use in, in art that, that would give me greater reliability when I, when I actually produced pieces or, or, or taught about the subject. So that's really where all of this begins. And um, I think at the time that I first got into this, uh, which was probably in high school or whatever, I, I, I really started to, to, to seriously research the subject when I was in uh, undergraduate school. and. Uh, I, I, I knew what I think most people know. I thought that camouflage probably involved figure ground blending. Uh, so it involved high similarity systems. Um, I think one of my friends had a pet chameleon and it could change its color, uh, you know, depending on which drapery it landed on, things like that. Um, I saw camouflage in nature, um, you know, in, in as I walked around my small town that I grew up in. Uh, here are, are some kind of more astounding examples. If you look at the left, the small photograph there, you see a flounder, a flatfish, uh, and uh, in the top photograph, his background, his sand background has been painted out, his or her, I guess. Um, and uh, in the bottom photograph, uh, the sand has been restored. I've actually seen these, and in, in they're, they're really quite astonishing. And the flounder can not only change its color, as can the chameleon, but it can also change its pattern. So there have been some experiments, uh, very forced obviously, of putting them in aquariums and uh, putting them on checkerboard backgrounds 
uh, and there are photographic, uh, you know, records of that, and they they very nearly blow out their liver trying to look like a checkerboard. It's really amazing. Yeah. Um, there are other famous examples of this. If you are interested in the Industrial Revolution and the uh, connection of that to the to evolution, Darwinian evolution, uh, there was. Um, the much debated now, but uh, long cited example of the British peppered moth, which you see there in the middle photograph. And, and the blue arrow is pointing to the one that's a little bit hard to see, which is the white variation of that. And then uh, the darker one is below. Well, what happened, of course, is that the white lichen in London, on London trees, which the, the white one uh, so effectively hit on, uh, be, the, the, the trees became blackened. and uh, so what happened is that uh, uh, this one became the predominant uh, form of it, and, and this one became the more rare form. This is a ghillie suit, which you've probably heard about in terms of hunting and all that sort of thing. But, but all of these really have to do with, with a relationship between figure and ground. It's about context, um, you know, and uh, trying to match the two. Now, what people uh, may not oops, excuse me, may not also realize is that uh, there's a kind of uh, spin-off of, of uh, figure ground blending, which is not, it's a conceptual figure ground blending, I suppose you could say, because what happens is that there are two different kinds of figures. This, one of these is a coral snake, which is highly poisonous, and one is not. It's completely harmless. Uh, I always carry this photo with me in my wallet in case I come upon two of these together. <laughs> pretty hard to remember, um, but the one that is non-poisonous is very much, of course, benefited by uh, its resemblance to the one that is poisonous. The monarch butterfly and the viceroy uh, are perhaps the most uh, uh, famous local example of that uh, in our area, but we have lots of leaf mimics. We don't have this one, which is a mantid, but we do have praying mantids, and we do have uh, leaf hoppers and bark mimics uh, in profusion. They're all over the place. You can find them very easily once you start looking for them. And of course you have things like the, scre the screech owl, which is a remarkable bark mimic. Uh, when, when it, once it closes its eyes uh, and it's sitting in a tree, it, it just looks like a piece of bark sitting there. Uh, you know. So it's, uh, it's, that's the difference, and I hope that's understandable. Now, what people have even less knowledge of, however, is um, another kind of camouflage, and they find it a little disturbing at times because they it seems to threaten their preconceptions about camouflage. It's something called figure, figure disruption, uh, disruptive camouflage, uh, or dazzle. And the word dazzle was, really came about during World War I because it was discovered that um, the kind of camouflage that had been used uh, by uh, soldiers, ground uh, f soldiers in um, World War I was not usable for camouflaging ships. Uh, why was that? Well, uh, these, these were mainly intended to avoid being hit by German submarines, uh, you know, who were hunting these ships down, uh, staying under the water, but, but putting up a periscope from a couple miles away because they themselves did not want to get uh, fired on. And uh, what did they have to do? Well, they had to shoot a torpedo at the ship. And what did that mean? Well, the ship is moving. And in fact, they're moving. And uh, so they had to not shoot where the ship is right now. They had to lead the target. And so they had to calculate from the observation point that they had, they had to calculate uh, the uh, uh, exact direction especially, but, but also the speed of the ship that they were about to shoot at. And so there was a great breakthrough because something like 600 British ships were, were, were sunk in one week during the worst part of this. And uh, there was a great breakthrough when British artists um, discovered or came to the insight that they should not be trying to hide the ships because you can't. If for no other reason, they're going to see the smoke coming out of their, their uh, stacks. But you can't hide them because water, the appearance of water changes. And besides, you're not looking at the water. You're looking at the background through a periscope, and the background is changing all the time, you know, and whatever. You, what you are really trying to do, you have to redefine, re, redefine the problem. You are trying to avoid being hit. 
uh, not avoid being seen, avoid being hit. Uh, and uh, that was uh, enormous, and it was um, presumably enormously successful. We don't know for sure, because it was never tested by, it was tested, but it was never tested by scientific uh, methods that we today would find acceptable. I, I find it interesting that after I published uh, my book on the history of all of this, um, uh, about six months ago, I think it was, or whatever, uh, someone, some scientist in England read that, read the book, and they set up experiments in disruptive camouflage, and they actually did now scientifically prove that it's a, a great advantage to be so, to be colored in that way. Uh, these are just other examples. Some of these are from the U.S. Patent Office. Some of these are Edward Wadsworth, who was a vorticist, uh, British vorticist. The thing I, perhaps I ought to get across very quickly is that, is that thousands of artists from all countries uh, who were involved in this conflict were actually conscripted for this specific purpose of serving as camouflage experts. Pretty amazing. And why did it happen then? Why didn't it happen uh, 50 years earlier or uh, 200 years earlier? The reason is because there was a coincidence of the invention of the airplane for aerial observation for military use. And uh, second, there was the increased use of long distance bombardment. So if you use the airplane, to locate the target behind enemy lines, then you could uh, <clears throat> use the cannon to actually hit those. So it, it was all motivated, camouflage, and the camouflage unit was all motivated by the notion of, of making it difficult to locate those targets. <clears throat> now, there's yet another kind of camouflage, and you may not know about it, but it's um, actually the most common in nature and in... Um, military use uh, or civilian use. And that is something in which uh, high similarity systems uh, are combined with high difference systems. In other words, figure ground blending is combined with figure disruption. And you can see it happening here. Here's the figure, it's been disrupted, but at the same time, there is an attempt to put it in a background or locate it in a background where there is um, some blending going on as we across here. Now, here's a wonderful natural example. I don't know if you are interested in snakes or we have a, happen to have a snake pit at our farm, so we, we love them. Uh, but uh, they're very hard to see, I mean, until you almost step on them. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is that uh, they're so well camouflaged. Uh, and this one in particular, which is, uh, has, has a kind of diamond pattern, it's not a, it's not a rattlesnake, but uh, you can see the coincidental and uh, high similarity stuff that's happening in combination. Um, I, I don't know if you know this, but there was a, one of the better known artists in this country uh, at the end of the 19th century was Abbot H. Thayer, who was a pupil of the French Academy and had come back to this country, uh, born in New Hampshire, had grown up in the woods. And uh, at some point he uh, began to discover or realize things about animal uh, coloration uh, protective coloration in, in nature, as it was called. It was not camouflage yet. The word hadn't been invented. But uh, he wrote this large book, Concealing Coloration in the Animal Kingdom. Uh, it was very controversial, um, not for its content so much as its tone. He was very outspoken. Uh, he was uh, manic depressive, uh, had lots of uh, troubles emotionally, um, but a very passionate man. And uh, some of his uh, students, and uh, one of whom was his relative, um, decided before, the, the Amer before America entered World War I that they would begin to form a, an American camouflage corps. Why? Well, because they had heard that the French artists in 1914 had done the same thing, some of whom had been associated with the Cubists uh, earlier, and uh, who, some of whom later publicly stated that they had actually borrowed uh, what they thought were Cubist uh, composition techniques uh, to dissolve figures uh, uh, in, on fi in field. So, who is this? Well, oddly enough, this is President Woodrow Wilson. This is in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the beginning of the war. This is John J. Pershing, the, the commanding general of the U.S. forces. Uh, they're having a demonstration uh, to, for Wilson of the American Camouflage Corps. Um, one of the guys who is uh, particularly good at all this is 
uh, an artist from Creston, Iowa. And uh, those of you who live in Iowa may know him because he is the sculptor uh, who sculpted the figure of uh, Chief Mahaska in the Oskaloosa Town Square, Sherry Fry. He was actually at that time, to, to give you uh, some notion of the fickleness of uh, art standards and galleries and so forth, uh, he was, if you go back to the magazines of that day, he was thought to have been one of the, the most promising young uh, sculptors in the world. Turns out now no one knows him. He's in the who's who in American women artists because he had the name Sherry. <laughs> you know, anyway. Do you want to repeat that? <laughs> okay. Hey, I wanted to tell you that on that very same day, guess who that is? That's John Singer Sargent. And he was at the White House. He was painting a portrait of Wilson. And Wilson said, hey, you've got to come with me. I've got to go see some camouflage stuff today. And they started talking about Thayer, both of whom, uh, well, Sargent knew Thayer quite well. And, uh, and, and Thayer, or Sergeant had, had this weird experience in which he agreed to go with Thayer to appear before the British uh, the war officers and demonstrate his stuff and uh, all of his ideas. And so he wanted to make some money off of it. And, and um, well, Thayer uh, chickened out and he, um, he, he just disappeared. And he went back home and had terrible nervous breakdowns and all that sort of thing. And... Uh, Sergeant was pretty uh, upset, but that's kind of funny. Now, so there you go. There are the three people. That's kind of fun, and uh, and then look and look. They just said to uh, Wilson, "Hey, um, there's a sniper within five feet of you." <laughs> See, where's the Secret Service? Yeah, and uh, Wilson says, "Oh, really?" And uh, and it turns out that that's a paper mache rock. And uh, in there is, I think, Sherry Fry, probably with, I don't know, maybe a wooden gun or something. Who knows? Um, this, is, uh, this is not what this talk is about, but uh, I wanted to tell you, uh, give you some sense of who contributed directly to either military or civilian camouflage during World Wars I and II. And this is an abbreviated, much abbreviated list. It's just astonishing. And of course, many of these people volunteered, uh, partly because they wanted to avoid being in the front line, uh, partly because they wanted to contribute in a way that was a, consistent with their own, uh, their own expertise. Uh, but uh, quite a few architects, uh, I just wrote a big article on architecture and camouflage, uh, and which is going to be in Lotus International in a couple of issues. Um, now, if we talk about zeitgeist, and if we talk about uh, coincidental occurrences, it's kind of interesting, and people at the time noticed this to some extent in obscure articles, that um, there were things going on in psychology, cognitive psychology, at the very same time, there were happening, beginning happening in Germany actually, around 1911. Gestalt psychology was being formed. It had really started out with uh, studying zoetropes, which were child's toys. I, I had one when I was a kid. Uh, and you put a band of, uh, you know, sequential figures in there, and then you spin the drum, and then you, you bend down and you look through those little slots, and you see motion pictures. It was a motion picture toy. I think it was invented about 1850, something like that. Well, Max Wertheimer, who was a Czech-born psychologist uh, looking for uh, a good thing to investigate in terms of vision, uh, apparently stopped off and bought one of these toys and then took it to the University of uh, Frankfurt uh, where he began to work with other people and trying to figure out how it is that we see. Well, that's kind of interesting in relation to camouflage because uh, you have to know that if you're a camoufleur because you want to prevent people from seeing or you want them to see in a way that is uh, spurious. So he came up with um, what we call the laws of perceptual organization. Uh, other people called them unit forming factors, which I find much more uh, concrete in, in its description. Um, and they are very much parallel to a list of principles that Thayer listed in his book called the laws of disguise. That's what he called them. And uh, they're also very, very consistent, not surprisingly, with um, what 
any design or, uh, or basic art textbook or layout textbook would refer to as design or layout principle. You, you know these as well as I do, similarity, proximity, grouping, continuity, closure. But just to remind you, uh, they are the principles the, in the inherent human tendencies by which we uh, uh, can uh, pass colorblindness tests if we're not colorblind. Uh, so uh, what does it mean? Well, it means that there is an integrity of the figure uh, the elements within it belong together uh, for some reason uh, or reasons. And then the second requirement is that they contrast with the ground. And uh, you can see that that's not in terms of circle, it's not in terms of shape because we have circles here. Uh, and it's not consistently in terms of size because that seems to be pretty homogeneous. But it's certainly based on color. So color is the, uh, is the, isolate, or is the defining attribute here. And... Uh, if the person is not colorblind, they can see the difference between these two areas. And, and we, we do the same thing without thinking about it when we look at a colored photograph in a magazine, which of course is done by four color process printing. It means it has to be separated uh, if it's done on, a, on that kind of press um, into four plates. And the plates consist of dots, which you blow, if you blow them up, then that's what they begin to look like. Well, we've seen indications of this already. Uh, in some of the other talks, but this is Isadora Duncan uh, as photographed by Edward Mybridge. And uh, you can go, uh, I mean, you can put these in that little drum and she'll dance around uh, if you look at it. Or uh, you can put it uh, simply on the internet or do it through PowerPoint. You can make her dance in PowerPoint. It's very, really quite easy. So the, the Gestralts were saying that we instinctively organize our experience. We don't even think about it. We instinctively do it on this level. Uh, it, it, we, we, you know, we instinctively break things into figures and grounds. They, they, they experimented with not doing that in what was called a Gansfeld, which was like a fog. We used to do it by putting ping pong balls, one half of ping pong balls on, uh, on our eyes. And, uh, and what they found that what happened is that after a slight... Uh, time period, uh, the human mind begins to manufacture a figure. Uh, it, it can't, it apparently has some, some kind of need for that, for that differentiation to happen. So we have uh, a process uh, that we call uh, grouping, uh, unit forming. Some people call it chunking. I don't find that very appropriate, but uh, it's, it's um, putting things together, separating them from other things. They may be figures, figures against ground, grounds, they, they may be figure against ground, who knows, uh, that's what we're doing here. We are uh, perceiving a series of separate uh, non-moving uh, images, and, but we are uh, seeing them as uh, one continuous uh, moving image. Um, I, th I think that uh, we go through life, uh, maybe Sesame Street is an example of that, since they're always asking you, what do things belong together? You know, uh, stuff like that. And they're telling you, you know, that's a car, that's a cup, that's glasses. You know, and uh, that's what we tell our kids and we tell them how to group things and we, in essence, um, non-systematically usually, we teach them about adult species or adult categories and, and to a great extent, the better they are in knowing those adult categories, whatever culture they are in, or whatever time period, because these things change as time passes. So if we go back in history, uh, things change. And if we go from geographically from one culture to another, these categories change. Uh, but obviously, being intelligent, being able to pass tests, being able to maneuver effectively, uh, not in a necessarily inventive way, but in, in an adult way, certainly, uh, is to be able to make uh, not just groupings, but groupings that are um, accepted and widely, widely believed. So, uh, I, I guess I've mentioned these before, but um, those same principles, and then if I can show you some people's use of those, there's a man named Ken Knowlton, um, who likes to do this thing where he, he actually makes portraits of people. There's Jean Cocteau, or Cousteau, Jacques Cousteau, uh, the oceanographer. And, uh, and then that is a, a, a portrait of, of uh, 
Jacques Cousteau made out of seashells very appropriately. And then if you, if you back up from it, you can see it even better because then uh, you know, it starts to fall together much, much better. Uh, he does, he's done a lot of these and, and uh, he, he does you know, Helen Keller using uh, braille dots. And it's pretty nice. And she and I share the same birthday. Yeah, but she's older. Um, Vic Muniz out of New York, uh, it does some pretty interesting stuff. This is a, a Matthew Brady photograph of a Civil War soldier, and it's actually made on a ta big tabletop, and it consists entirely of little s plastic soldiers that are arranged in certain ways. These, this is a close-up of them, but from this particular point of view, then they make that, that particular portrait. It's all because of the grouping process. Um, we make a lot of grouping errors. We can actually cause them to happen. Um, they often happen, uh, you know, like in this uh, Lone Ranger having a cactus coming out of his head. Do you really believe that, Craig? I don't think so. Uh, but um, the Gestaltists would say, well, there are certain similarities happening. Uh, there, you know, the highlight and the shadow are, are converging. And they would also say that there's a size, you know, a, a band width uh, or whatever that, that's happening here. And then they would also say, well, now, uh, Lone Ranger, you could just get rid of all this by telling Silver to move over a little bit, <laughs> you know. And then you would break the proximity, um, the overlapping uh, connection. But my students and I have been experimenting with, uh, you know, trying to do this in, uh, um, deliberately. And these, they've done some wonderful things. Like this is a tiny plastic football helmet. And uh, this is the student's brother. And he's standing at a distance. And then she's, she's actually taking the photograph and holding the helmet up to make it fit on his head. And here, she's gone out to Bob's Guitars in Cedar Falls. And Bob has a a guitar on his sign and she's got her brother holding his hand up like that and making it look like he's holding the guitar. Anyway, well that's okay. But uh, I did those as, as a kid. I would put my parents inside of a fruit jar and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that no one is better at taking advantage of all of this and you can read about it and work with it if you want than uh, magicians. Uh, and um, they do it in some pretty astounding ways, and I think we don't know that as much as we used to know because almost everybody who's growing up now has never actually stood before a magician or stood three feet from a magician and watched coins disappear or, or coins appear or a pigeon appear out of nowhere uh, or, you know, or whatever. And, uh, and that, does not, that is not the same experience as, as turning on the television and watching them because... Video, seeing it on video is not the same. To see it in your own presence, with your own eyes, to witness it, and to not know how it happened. Um, I, I, don't, I, think, I think people ought to experience that because they're too ready to believe um, what politicians and what all kinds of other people tell them in their own presence. Um, thank you, Craig. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, in, in the history of design, the history of art, we've done this, we've played with this a lot of different ways, proximity, uh, uniforming, and through similarity, what other col color differences. This is a famous uh, Bauhaus poster uh, using letter forms, and of course, these are units, uh, Stockliches and Bauhaus and Weimar, but here color is being used just to cause trouble and to break them up and to create a kind of uh, contradictory pattern that is not so contradictory that you can't easily read it. This is done in a lot of different ways. Uh, Leo Leone uh, did it with New York by spacing things wide apart. We have things called word search puzzles, which, which uh, work by this phenomenon. But uh, you can do it in lots of different ways. At the Museum of Modern Art at Oxford, they were doing it by spacing, but also by bringing in kind of pinstripe lines of, of one kind or another. Um, there are lots of uh, people who have commented on this kind of thing. I guess this isn't showing up very well. But certainly one of them who influenced me dramatically many years ago, uh, now deceased, is, was the art historian E.H. Gombrich, uh, who tried to look at art and art history in terms of perception. And he also looked at aesthetics that way in uh, a, a much narrower way, I think, than what we've been talking about here. 
but he talked about aesthetic form, aesthetic patterns, and uh, said that they seem to, uh, at the bottom line, they seem to lie somewhere between boredom and confusion. Uh, Rudolf Arnheim, uh, who was one of the students of the Gestalt psychologist in Berlin and is still alive at 101, uh, is um, also one of the people who influenced me through art and visual perception and other books. But um, he says something similar where he's talking about uh, that. And, and you can do this typographically. Actually, I've kind of borrowed this from Gary Kepish. But um, monotony, I mean, it's, it, you, you, you can make things really so similar as is the letters in the, in the background here. Um, or you can break them up and you go into the kidnapper's note um, motif, you know, that kind of thing. Well, there was a person, um, Donna Sedantis, uh from the Boston area, I believe, who uh, did a book in 73 called A Primer of Visual Literacy, which was I found pretty instructive. It's it, not to my taste in terms of the way it was laid out or presented, but it certainly had some wonderful information in it that was helpful to me. And she actually lined up columns of attributes and said, well, some of these are supportive of unit making. They, they, they tend to uh, make us interpret things as connecting, uh, whereas other things are unit breaking um, and so forth. Uh, Kepish had talked about that in a very influential textbook called Language of Vision. Uh, which was widely used. It's even it's actually still in print now, uh, and if you read it, it's uh, still better than any basic design foundations design textbook that is in print. I think. But he he, he talked about order, coherence, discipline, stability. On the one hand, we seem to have um, we, we seem to need that, and at the same time, that isn't enough, and uh, we need to go toward. Um, I hate to use the word chaos because it's being used in a very different way in uh, fractal art stuff now, but um, toward movement, vitality, change on the other. Um, so I, I, why, is, why are these things convincing to me? Because I, I throughout the years, I've found my, the, my daily problems are almost of those sorts that, when, let's say I'm trying to think about a career, I'm trying to think about a job, I mean, a lot of my students come to me and they want something that's stable. Their parents have told them, cautioned them about, get something that's stable. You don't want to be a bohemian artist. You want something that fits into society. And, and, or I'll have people transferring in from the business college who, who have gone through three years of stability and they're going crazy and they're, <laughs> they're looking for some dynamism <laughs> and they've come to graphic design hoping that 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 might offer some mediation between the two. But I think one way or another, whether in marriage, whether in uh, uh, kind of self-growth, uh, whether in uh, what we do in terms of work and play, how we earn money, how we fit into society, we must find some way of being both um, structured and also non-structured. We have to be spontaneous and improvisational uh, at the same time as kind of knowing where we're going. Um, so what I tend to end up doing in my own life and, and, uh, is I would like to think I am not right-brained uh, totally, and I'm not left-brained predominantly, but I make a great effort to be a, a kind of balance of both, and I believe that it's a dynamic balance that moves back and forth and back and forth, and sometimes it goes toward one extreme. Uh, you know, you can think of uh, uh, Philip Glass's music and how repetitive, almost monotonous it appears to be. Somebody was talking about Philip Sousa uh, music. Uh, it was kind of the Philip Glass of uh, the 19th century, maybe. Um, you know, or you think of Patti Smith and Wild Horses and how wonderfully uh, orchestrated that is, uh, and yet it appears to be so chaotic on the surface. Uh, remarkable, how can she pull all those things together? So my own notion of aesthetics, which has gradually evolved, and it's not widely shared, but other people do have said the same thing, is that it really is best to go back to what was apparently its original meaning before, eight, uh, before 1753, is that when Baumgartner came out with his book? But um, uh, that it was the opposite, it was the antonym of anesthetic. And if we still have this, the consistent meaning of anesthetic, meaning that we become, in, uh, you know, isolated from you know, the impingement of outside experience or whatever, 
and we've become, uh, and, and we do it. We actually, you know, we, we can do it through meditative trance uh, and uh, through other kinds of things. But we can also do it as, as some uh, medical and uh, psychiatric uh, researchers have said, we can also do it in the opposite direction through high difference. So here we do it through high similarity, here we do it through high difference. Kind of interesting, isn't it, in relation to blending and, and uh, disruption, that we should have the same kind of co uh, continuum. So this is called hyperarousal, this is called hypoarousal. This is um, speaking in tongues, uh, things uh, which are um, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, overly active to, to the, to the ex extreme. Uh, I've read some uh, comparisons to maybe this is what happens when people go to rock uh, shows, rock music shows, and they get into these kinds of uh, trance states, whatever. Um, I don't know, but um, my own sense of aesthetics is that it is back and forth within here, and that probably avant-garde, I, I hate to use that word, <laughs> um, probably innovative particularly contributive aesthetic uh, patterns uh, tend toward the edge uh, and, uh, and that the center fluctuates back and forth, back and forth, as it did, for example, in the history of design with going from uh, late modernism where you had the less is more and then going to postmodernism where supposedly you have uh, more is more. But if you look at them and you look at the best examples of them and... Um, my gosh, they're using the same gestalt principles and they're organizing things in the very same way, I think because we're built that way. Um, well, some people uh, in design, for example, do this purposely uh, for, and, and they go to the edge. Uh, this person is trying to develop a poster, trying to get people to feel what it, to sense what it might, might feel like not being able to read. So he's eliminated the spaces between words. And so he says, if reading this is hard, uh, imagine, uh, oops, it, not reading at all. Yes, well, there you go. Huh. Proof is in the pudding. There you go. Okay. And um, so this is kind of uh, using high connection and using it to particular advantage. This is using uh, uh, very high difference in, in what we as designers would think of as a joke because it's uh, making fun of this uh, uh, very highly revered modern furniture by uh, Charles M. Gray Eames, the lounge here in Ottoman. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, now, um, you can find this all over the place, and once you realize what it is explicitly, and actually um, most of the time we don't realize it, just as we don't know the tricks behind the magician's pranks, and usually they don't tell us. Um, designers don't usually go around, unless they're writing textbooks, tell us how, how, what they're doing. They simply do it, and we respond to it. This is, an, uh, this is what I saw when I was opening up in our history magazine, and I found this ad from Oxford uh, University Press, and uh, it's uh, talking about a new series of books at the time. Uh, th these were the covers of the books, and they all had this kind of little logo, orange logo, uh, to identify them. They all have the same proportion, which, by the way, is the golden proportion. And then they all had uh, some kind of detailed photograph pertaining to the subject. Well, this ad uses the same proportion. It uses this, though not in the same uh, proportion as it is in the cover. And then it, and then it says, you know, the whole uh, marketing thing is that it's a fresh, fresh look at art history, doing it in a fresh way, different from all the others. And so it comes looking at art history from, whoop, a fresh perspective, changes to italic, has a little line divider here. Interestingly, that, that little line divider hits the bat, back leg of, uh, of that Alvo Alto uh, chair and so forth. We call these grid systems or grid lines. Uh, I have some fine art friends who, who actually turn livid if you mention the word grid. And I've been on graduate committees with them where they caution their students never to use grids. But um, then I have to take them aside and quietly explain, well, actually, we've been using grid lines, well, very explicitly, at least since the Italian Renaissance, because what are those checkerboard floors about in, in uh, linear perspective? Well, they're about grids, except that the grid is laid down on the supposed the illusionary floor instead of being this way. What do they do? Oh, they're, I don't, they, they just, they are what we call in, in uh, cognitive psychology, uh, edge alignment. When, when the edges of things line up, 
they tend to imply through uh, uh, re reader contribution uh, a, a continuous line. And they make things appear to belong together. We do it all the time, marching bands and, and whatever. I, mean, I was in the military. We, we had military alignment. What did that mean? That meant when you stood for inspection, your, your shirt, edge of your shirt, had to be lined up exactly with your belt buckle, had to be lined up exactly with your fly, or you were out of order. You know? So I've never done that since then. <laughs> Now, this is a poster by M. Cassandra, who is one of the most famous poster designers in history, uh, the Art Deco period. Art Deco had, was a kind of an interesting uh, geometrically based style, mostly of design, uh, but it also had a wonderful kind of vitality to it that was not of the same feeling that one finds in constructivism, uh, you know, Russian or Dutch. And uh, here you can see uh, Cassandra doing these things where he's... Uh, Choosing a typeface that has a perfect O, a perfect circle for an O, and then and then he's playing with little coincidences. He's even playing with dots, and you know he's getting the bottom of the ear to line up with the bottom of the nose, to the eyebrow to line up with the top of the ear, and you know he's playing with the circle thing. He's playing warm against cool, um, you know dark against light, you know, modulated uh, against uh, flat graphic stuff. Uh, we we commonly do this kind of stuff, uh, not in the process of doing our own posters necessarily. We sort of develop an intuitive sense of when things are um, lining up or working. But uh, it's very interesting to to do this and to, to do this and to 